Hi. Um, my name is Steve Chai. I'm the uh, director for the State Innovation Group at the Innovation Center at CMS. Um, you know, they always put CMS at the end of the panel, and you know, it's just you know, after a brilliant report by people that I love and this panel, it's hard to sort of finish off and add something smart, but I will try. Um, uh, and Jeff, I love the fact that you're now, after years of yelling at me, I used to be the chief medical officer at Medicaid, years of yelling at me about what payers should do, I'd like to see you in a similar situation now. We should talk later. But. Um, <laughs> um, so again, echo the themes of fantastic report and, and echo the hearing the voices. Melinda, again, to call you out. Every time I sort of wrote something in the margin, I would see two paragraphs later, you would say the same thing. So um, I, really, really vibrant discussion in terms of what happens. And my, my thoughts are more to be complimentary, not to be oppositional, because I think there's all, this was such a great foundation for really establishing where we are right now and then a great base from us to move forward. Um, so just quickly, uh, and so just uh, in the State Innovation Group, I oversee the SIM Awards, which is about a billion dollars for states to support their efforts to accelerate state-based transformation. I also oversee the all-payer models or the multi-payer models, particularly Maryland, Vermont, and now rural Pennsylvania. We're trying to take a geographic approach to an all-in approach to how we can think about um, reform. Um, and in my role as CMO before, a Chief Medical Officer at Medicaid, um, uh, you know, led an effort, and really, let's be honest, Kate Newhausen, who is now the medical director, Medicaid medical director in Virginia, wrote most of it, but um, I think our longest uh, informational bulletin history on what we called super utilized at the time. Um, so one of the pieces in that IB I wanted to start off with was we used this word, which we were later criticized for not being a word, but um, uh, impactable. And I think it's sort of come up a couple times. And I think when I looked at the taxonomy, my biggest reaction was, and I think it was mentioned in the report, but just to really bring it out, is the need for the connection between the care delivery and the taxonomy. Um, that is to say, I think, um, and let me be very clear, um, my states may throw me under the bus right now because our states have repeatedly asked us, we need help identifying who these beneficiaries of complex needs are. We hear that repeatedly. Um, but I will say, I think even despite what I just said, I feel like we get caught up in that a little bit. I feel like it's a little bit sometimes where we get very um, uh, focused on the analytics behind that. Instead of looking at the interventions that work, what we know how to do, and then going backwards from there to find the venues to match them up with the interventions. And it struck me that then, I th Rainu, I think you touched on, them, on this in terms of stratifying versus segmenting. It struck me that there are probably two purposes for the taxonomy, very different. Um, one is for payers or for uh, uh, to think about how do you uh, do predictive analytics or how do you assign payment both for purposes of identifying to shunt people into a program as well as potentially to adjust payment policies to better risk adjust. So the, what are the predictive analytics behind who those next year's anal, uh, high utilizers were, are? And to me, for that, you want to dump every piece of data you got into it and try and think about, uh, and people who are much smarter than me can talk about how to do this, but it seems to me that's a much different task than the second which I think stems straight off of the connection to the interventions, which is, I have a hammer, where are those nails? And, and so I think that connection, um, uh, I think that's much more, um, to me, a useful uh, obsession, frankly, in terms of thinking about how to find those people. We know how to impact these particular people because there's a proven intervention. Um, and, and I think we have spent, and, and we, CMS, this is not we, uh, um, NAM has spent a lot of time thinking about this taxonomy, um, and, and I think where I think where I was struck by this report in particular was in fact that second section on the interventions, which I thought was just fabulous. Um, and I think one of the the taxonomies that I felt was most useful was. Um, um, Box four one, which is really the taxonomy of, of of delivery models, and what at what is that categorization of successful care models that we have out there? You talked about enhanced primary care, transitional care, and integrated care in particular. That last piece, thinking about social determinants of health, um, and and sorry, one more piece on the taxonomy before I move on, which is that I, I was also struck, and I think it was a theme. And this is, again, I'm sure a point of contention that was mentioned, but um, I wonder how much of this is different by population, that the functional status I thought was fantastic to put in. As the former CMO of Medicaid, when I think about what we saw, 
the behavioral health and the SUD was um, so much more a factor than the functional status. And I think it was included in your definition of functional status, but as you disseminate this report, I would just say underscore that piece in the report where you say functional status includes a broad definition, because I think particularly for Medicaid, it is about that piece that you talked about. Um, so in terms of interventions, I thought it was, it was a fantastic um, uh, segmentation of taxonomy of the different types of interventions we've had. How do we think about um, uh, the, the various kinds of care models that have been successful to date. And I think that's fantastic. And it struck me, the, the only thing that in the report struck me is, you know, this is something that I'm not sure I agree with, was there was one line in there where you said the report doesn't really deal with population health and prevention. Um, and I, I had a reaction to that because um, I think everything in this report and everything we've heard today is really thinking about, maybe it's not prevention, that's probably a fair statement, but that idea of thinking about the health of an entire population, including the distribution of outcomes within that population, that they can dig thing that we always come back to again and again. That's what we're doing here, right? And, and I think, I, I know you all know that, I don't mean to be um, hammering the point, but I, I do think that as we think about the implications of this report, um, I just want to caution us to be sure that we understand that how we think about that population as a whole is the key to, uh, as we call it now, beneficiaries with complex need, and vice versa. We can't think about really being successful on community health worker interventions, on social determinants of health, unless we're really targeting those at the beneficiaries who most need them. These are two buckets that need to be matched and need to be paired um, inseparably. Um, so last thing I'll just say very briefly, uh, um, I think it talked about some of the challenges in data. Um, couldn't agree more. We are still struggling with that. Um, I don't have the magic bullet for you. I think talking similarly about quality measurement, my only comment on quality measurement, and I see, again, smarter people in the room than me, but um, is, is that the more we can think about getting towards health outcomes in addition to quality, and I know we always talk about that, but actually from a payer standpoint, as CMS, to think about how we integrate those into our payment model, um, and not just as we're, we're gonna look at this too, but in the traditional way we use quality metrics, we are right there, and we should be thinking about what that means. Um, let me just pause there. <laughs>